start, if I could ask you all to pull out your mobile phone and turn it in the off position for the next hour. It's a small room and they tend to be a little uh, disruptive. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the A. Stefano Bueri, who joins us today. Uh, I presume you've flown over from Italy, <laughs> yeah, from nearby. Um, Stefano was with us two and a half, three years ago for an event I held here on the topic of architectural magazines, which is one of his many areas of expertise, uh, and which we opened up a discussion on the relationship between media, magazines, and the circulation of architectural ideas through media of various kinds. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for us to look now at some of the recent work that he's been doing uh, in his role as editor-in-chief of Avatari magazine uh, in Italy, where he's been the editor since, I believe, September 2007 for about a year and a half now. Prior to that, Stefano, of course, was the editor of Domus magazine during a three or four year period um, in which he absolutely transformed uh, an already iconic <coughs> uh, European journal of architecture into one that really became an incredibly influential shaper of architectural ideas in recent years, not just in Europe, but really around the world. Uh, in addition to those activities, Stefano heads uh, Boeri Studio in Milan and has been working for many years on projects across Europe. Uh, he also directs a collective research agency uh, known as Multiplicity, whose results have been published uh, in many different forums uh, and venues, including uh, a lovely chapter of a book uh, titled Mutations that came out a few years ago, and the chapter was titled The Uncertain States of Europe which looked at the changing territorial and spatial realities of Europe today and is one of Stefano's many interests uh, in architecture and urbanism as we know it. I think it's fair to say Stefano is absolutely a shaper of contemporary architectural culture and not just a participant uh, in that area and it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to the A. Stefano, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. It's a really pleasure for me to come back here. And uh, well, I'll uh, show you uh, parts of the research that I had developed in the last five years through the magazine that, uh, that I have run it. And part of the uh, project that I am now developing in the Mediterranean area. Uh, let's start with this first point. Uh, uh, for many things, I think that uh, the idea of uh, running um, a magazine, it's uh, a way to produce research. And uh, as you probably know, because that was a really the subject of the lecture I did here a few years ago, uh, I think that uh, we have always to uh, observe, maintain, and consider a certain distance between research and design. Research is quite always inclusive, needs uh, opinions, needs thoughts, needs uh, our capacity to open the future, to introduce new possibilities. So in a way, it's uh, like a sequence of uh, acts and action oriented to the idea of opening and include. And from another point of view, I think that design is in itself uh, exclusive. When we are involved in a design practice, in a design procedure, we have to select the reality. We have to select uh, the possibility. We have to, uh, as you know very well, to a certain point, arrive to define one single material configuration. So I think that, uh, in a way, this uh, schizophrenic uh, relation between research has an in inclusive activity and design on another side, it's something which is really specific of our profession. And uh, these two spheres are part of our profession. And I think that the, the way we are more capable to maintain these two spheres autonomous, but in a way, uh, determine the condition for a fertile exchange between these two spheres is exactly uh, I think the one of the possible result of our profession. So starting with research and what I've done with the media, uh, uh, I've started one year ago to run uh, 
the Bitari magazine. And Bitari is an Italian magazine, an international magazine. It was founded in 1962. And uh, what we have done with the Bitari was basically uh, an attempt to introduce in the architectural media uh, the dimension of literature. But uh, uh, I want to be very clear on this. So the point is not simply to have on the pages of a design of an architectural magazine pieces written, text written, essay written by uh, writers or novelists. No, that's not the point. The point is for me was, from a completely another uh, perspective, let's try to have some writers to locate this imaginary in a specific space, to locate this perspective on reality in a specific place. So what we have done, this is the first issue of Bitaria to present in Florence and how done by Bruce Sterling, uh, but sorry, by Francois Roche, and asking Bruce Sterling, who probably you know, is a, well, a science fiction novelist, let's say, to imagine a novel who is in a way located in that specific environment. Uh, why? Uh, well, there are many, many explanations. That's something that we are now repeating in the magazine. So we are asking different writers to imagine, to locate, to work like storytellers, but having like a scenario of the story, some specific architectures. Well, I, I think that more or less what we do when we run a magazine is to produce simulacra. We are not simply representing the reality. We are, in a way, substituting the reality. We are substituting what is there and what you and me and the readers will never probably experience with something which is produced by ourselves, by who works in the media. So I, I think that uh, from a certain point of view, we have to, we should have the feeling of this responsibility. And we should have the feeling that nowadays, the distance between, let me say, the soul and the body of a building, the soul and the body of an architecture, I mean, what is material in there, and what is flying and running, thanks to our capacity to produce simulacra, well, we have to have the feeling that this responsibility is very, is nowadays extremely relevant. And we not, cannot simply say, well, uh, we are monthly producing simulacra of what we will never probably experience, we will never touch, we will never pass through and so on. But the point is that we cannot simply say, well, that's something that we cannot avoid to do. My opinion is that if you work in a media, in architectural media, you have to consider this, that the, all the problematics and all the possible consequences that are coming from this distance between the soul and the body of an architecture. And exactly the attempt to introduce literature, in my opinion, is a possible way to reduce this distance. So it's a possible way to help the reader through the magazine to have a more complex, a richer idea of what a physical architecture is. And uh, you could imagine this is quite strange, but I really think that this is a uh, one of the possibilities we have nowadays. Uh, second point. That's something that you probably know. We started uh, the, for the first issue of the magazine. Um, we have done something that you probably know. But before this, this is the last issue of Domus, which was in the April uh, 2007, or six, seven, seven. And uh, but for instance, we were in, in Japan, and uh, what we did here was to ask some sort of kids to take pictures by their perspective of uh, and resilience, of course. And uh, this kind of way to, let me say, uh, try to imagine uh, a perspective on the building of architecture which use the eyes of the real users is also something which apparently is so banal, but it's so complicated to realize it in a magazine. So uh, thanks to the work uh, of uh, Ida Becker that you probably know, so something that has been shown in the Biennale and uh, 
and maybe you have invited them also here or not, huh? but in any case, we have introduced a series of uh, uh, articles who were exploring the life after the disappearance of the architect in some very famous and hyper celebrated architecture. So you know that what we have done with the, the house life of uh, Nicolas Bordeaux house, but uh, uh, we are now doing the same thing with other very famous buildings. And always the idea is to, to select some very specific users, in this case are the cleaners, the weekly cleaners of the facade, which are in a way representing their point of view, representing their perspective, commenting the quality of the building by, on their specific uh, perception. That's uh, Richard Meyer Church in Rome, and in this case are the prayers of the people who go to every Sunday there to say what how it works, how it doesn't work, how it can be imagined in a different way, and so on and so on. A third uh, point that, in my opinion, is uh, crucial in, uh, when you have to run an architectural magazine is uh, to, uh, to really pay attention to the richness and the complexity of the images. And that means it's not simply that, well, you have to select good images and uh, explicit images and images who can who are rich, complex. But that's not enough. I think that uh, you have also to feel the responsibility that when you publish an image in an architectural magazine, you have to, to, to deal with this complexity. So for instance, what we have started to do with the first issue, this is something we have done with, um, with a group of sociologists. Bruno Latour was working seriously with us on this, was to, let's take an image like this one. That's an image of well, and, and it's an, an attempt to uh, deconstruct this image, but uh, starting from the uh, serious observation of its ambiguity. This image is uh, ambiguous in itself, so because it's, well, it's a piece of an urban, of a public space, uh, but uh, what exactly is she doing? What is she? What, what is happening? No? So, uh, there is an ambiguity in this image who asks us uh, a series of possible uh, interpretations, a series of possible visual association and uh, conceptual uh, uh, association. So uh, I think that, that this kind of work that we are seriously repeating at the magazine, so let's say to have an image, this sometimes the image is produced by, well, a famous photographer, sometimes it's absolutely, uh, 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 daily banal image you know, that you can find on the newspaper or on the TV set. Um, but in any case, the point is always how many possible worlds you have in one image. And this is another, I think, uh, 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 another, another responsibility you have when you work in a, in, in a magazine. Another point which is connected to this, that we, I started, I was, I, that's something that I'm really obsessioned and uh, <laughs> I started to do this with Domus, but I am now going ahead with Abitarium. It's uh, the relation between, let me say, daily life and architecture, or chronicle. You know, uh, what happens daily, day by day, and, and architectures which are, as we know, standing in a place, which are stable, which are done by stones, done by glass, and so on. So uh, I was very, very uh, attracted by the idea that sometimes there is something which happens mysteriously around in the context, in the border of some very famous architect architecture. We don't know exactly why this happens, but it's true. There is a part of uh, the daily life in, in all its dramatic or, or tragic or uh, ridiculous connect, uh, components which are sometimes happening nearby a famous building. Uh, sometimes it's because maybe there is an attraction that this kind of building are capable to produce in the unconscious dimension of the citizens of the user. Or sometimes it's completely casual, but this happens. So we, we, on Domus we were 
the monthly following and trying to, to do, to observe it. And, uh, uh, well, this was, uh, in my opinion, extremely uh, interesting. And when we started to do the same thing with Abitra, we tried also to do the uh, sort of opposite uh, gaze. So in this case, we are not observing what happens around uh, uh, a building, a very famous architecture, thanks to the fact that something has happened around it. But we are observing, as we say, the presence of a building with a sort of lateral gaze, with a sort of lateral point of view. So this is, a, again, a, a way to detect the capacity of uh, architecture to deal with social life, to deal with daily behaviors, if you, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. So it's, a, I think, a, an interest, both are interesting way to work with a sort of lateral presences of uh, hyper-famous buildings. Uh, that's something of very problematic. Who knows how a magazine works knows it. Because Lucy, for instance, is here knows very well that when you have to deal with uh, design, furniture design, for instance, you, you know that when you are running a magazine, you should have a very, uh, a very constant relation with ads. Um, and uh, the point is that uh, uh, it's easy to say, well, let's compress ads in a part of the magazine. Let's imagine that the magazine is uh, done by two spheres. One is completely commercial and the other is completely intellectual. But we know that this is not true. This is completely hypothesis. Because what's happened normally is that also when you work as in, 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 a, in a, let me say, intellectual sphere, using your intellectual sphere, you have to uh, maintain a relation with uh, all the economical and financial energy which comes from the ads, because are the ads the more relevant energy for a magazine? So 80% of a magazine is produced by advertising. So we, in a, in a, during the, the, this last two years, uh, we accepted with Habitare the cohabitation between uh, pages which are directly produced by ourselves, by editorial staff, and pages we are directly produced by who produce ads. And uh, we are now trying to, to, to work on this, which is not easy, but I think that's a, that's a very important point. So to accept the task, accept the fact that you are, to, to in a way, to dialogue or to fight, you have not to avoid or to raise a conflict which is evident, but that uh, also is a way to, let me say, to reduce the uh, hypothesis of, uh, of, uh, of what normally happens between ads and content in a, in a magazine. Uh, what I was saying before about the presence of uh, writers or the presence of novelists is not that we don't need other possible description. I'm completely uh, obsessional by the necessity of uh, precise description of uh, a denotation of uh, what architecture is producing. And uh, uh, for instance, what we, we, we do with Habitare is that uh, for every project, we are, from one hand, asking a writer to locate his imaginary with a story and a novel. And on the other hand, we are asking a, a, a group of uh, uh, graphic designer and producer of diagrams to do things like this one, which are like uh, two, three, four pages, which are like we have done with images, deconstructing the project. So trying to focus on very different aspects of the story. And, and uh, this kind of pages, in my opinion, are, are uh, uh, not less uh, relevant than the ones we are dedicating to writers or to novelists. The point is how we can combine them together. And that's really what I'm interested to to develop. So it's, it's important to, to have both these dimensions. And uh, this is called istruzioni per uso, instruction. So uh, it's a way in which you are imagining that the reader can really understand how a building works, but also 
go deeper in some concept which is behind an, a conceptual, a, an architectural idea. And maybe focus on partner that can go deeper in its uh, human nature. Uh, and the same thing we are doing with a series of lectures. This is uh, in Samari. In Samari is uh, probably the last witness of, uh, of a very Nobile story of an uh, Italian furniture designer. And uh, what he has done for us is to, well, is, is, a, is an attempt to, to show how uh, drawing is not a simply a way to represent reality, but nowadays is a way to uh, bring back some attitudes, bring back some processes, some mental processes, which now we have completely delegated to, uh, let me say, to, to personal computers, but to, 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 uh, to program, uh, to CAD. And, and uh, what Ensemari is doing is, uh, well, it's in my opinion, uh, uh, important also in this attempt to, to help the readers to uh, improve their control of the reality because he's explaining how the idea of learn again to draw, to use drawing, is not simply, uh, let me say, a, 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 let me say a, a, a fashion, uh, uh, fashionable attitude or something which is simply edulcorating our proposal, but it's a way to enrich our capacity of imagination and of control of the transformation that we are exploring and dreaming when we are in a design process, within a design process. Uh, that's another thing that we have introduced with the Bitari magazine, still in the idea that the magazine is a tool, basically. And the point is how we can uh, conserve the complexity, but also the efficiency of this tool. So what we are doing here is very simple. We ask uh, in every issue uh, a young architect to send us his project, his proposal, and then we ask uh, two famous designers and architects. I started with my mother, my mother was, uh, and he's a designer, and, uh, but that's one simply a way to, is a dedicate that I have done. But uh, after her, uh, we moved to other, uh, like Gilles Clement or Kengo Kuma. And the point which is interesting is that we are asking them to correct, to intervene in the, on the project proposed by the young uh, uh, or a collective group or a young single architect and to, sh to tell explicitly what, in their opinion, doesn't work, how the project can be improved or completely <laughs> changed. And we are very, very strong in asking the two, let me say, famous uh, interlocutors to, to, to intervene because, and that's happened, which is, in my opinion, quite, sorry, that's something on the images, but uh, uh, it works very well because it's a very explicit and drastic way to put together uh, the capacity of uh, uh, intervening and changing and modifying uh, of uh, some uh, 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 well no architects on the, on the proposal. But the point is that we are here touching another point, which is uh, the, the idea of teaching. Because uh, uh, from another point of view, I think that magazines should become teaching devices, should become tools also in this idea that they are a way that the reader can use to learn thanks to the interaction with some of the architects. So we are not simply uh, interested to have famous architects on the pages of the magazine. We want them to interact with the reader. This is the fact that sometimes this, these architects are also working in a very, very enriching the thing. Well, we know that magazines are not simply a series of pages. Uh, magazines are nowadays uh, websites, which is a bit our website, uh, are 
uh, international platform. So we have now a, a Chinese version of Aditara, we have a Bulgarian and a, let me say Balkanic version of the magazine. We have something which is done by someone which you know well. Zach is a, one of the best graphic designer uh, nowadays in Europe who has designed this. Uh, this is a, a, a supplement and there is a reader digest. So we are monthly collecting the text and the articles on architecture who are appearing all over the world. In the newspaper, and that's a way to help the readers to, to keep this, uh, uh, to be, be updated about the publisher, also not in our magazine. But uh, there is another dimension of the magazine that I consider relevant, which is the uh, fact that the magazine should, be, should work uh, also producing events and not necessarily through the pages, and not necessarily through the site, the website, and not necessarily through the media, but directly. So the idea of magazine you can produce reality. Uh, that's something that now I'm showing you, which is uh, probably the most crazy and uh, in a way the most uh, successful from another point of view thing we have done. Here we are in Milano, stadio, football stadium in Milano, so San Siro Stadium. And it was April uh, 2005 with Domus. We have rented for one day from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, the stadium, inviting like uh, 80, 85 uh, designers, artists, performers, musicians. And what was, uh, was uh, crazy was that really we were, I think, capable to change the identity of this uh, uh, space. This is, so we, we have the Matthew Barney, we have uh, uh, Rick Ritira Vaninja, uh, and then let me say 30 of the most famous designers were, it was during the Salone del Mobile, the, the fair, the design fair in Milano, so it's a moment of, and then uh, we were really changing the idea of a public environment, because that's, as we know, has. Erwin Goffman was saying uh, three decades uh, uh, ago, uh, there are two kinds of public space. There are public space which are focusing on one event in which the other person are more or less, uh, all the people which are the public, this is Matthew Barney, are asked to observe the evolution of one event. And there are public space which are in a way a place in, in which you can have different behavior, different events at the same time. So. The idea to transform uh, an arena, a football stadium like San Siro, in a, in a really in a part of the city, so in a, we are completely open and permeable and heterogeneous and in a way unpredictable because that's something that connotates really the identity of the state. It's uh, the fact that it is generous because it's not capable to define the kind of things that should happen. In, in the more we are more capable to introduce unpredictability, the more we are realizing a, a real public space. So the field was used only for this, like a performance, but uh, we are expecting uh, 6,000 people and in reality we, at a certain point of the night, we were hosting like uh, 43,000 people. So they were coming, destroying more or less all the <laughs> installation we have uh, done and uh, was uh, at the same time a nightmare and, and uh, and something which remains in my mind like an unbelievable experience. And I, to be very honest, uh, I'd love to repeat it because it was, a, was like uh, 40 events in different places. Sometimes it was simultaneous, sometimes it was in sequence. And every visitor had uh, simply a map with a chronological sequence of things. So that was, was uh, to the capacity of the visitor to, to more or less decide how to go, where and how and to touch and things of this thing. Uh, then we are doing other things. That's something that we are doing always in the salon, like changing installation, producing part of discussion of thoughts. Uh, but another point that, in my opinion, is, uh, is very important and finishing on this part uh, is that uh, a magazine, when it's not uh, simply asked to intervene in the, let me say, reality, it's also uh, if he wants to be aware of his responsibility, if he, 
it's a, it is aware of this uh, power in the media sphere. Well, I think uh, that the magazine should play and has to play a political role. And uh, for instance, with Domos, what we have done uh, three years ago was to try to intervene uh, in, a, in, in an impossible environment. So we are in a shadow zone, which is the, uh, uh, the Pyongyang uh, uh, urban uh, environment in, in North Korea. And uh, we went there with a magazine. We spent there one week. Uh, well, it was crazy. I have to tell you that it's really a, a ghost city, but at the same time, it's a science fiction city. Uh, it's a city where in 52, the dictator with the staff of architects were capable to imagine a city who was punctuated by copies of all the more important monuments of the history of architecture. So it's, it's, a, so it's a totally crazy, paradoxical, and uh, uh, stupid at the same time, a sequence of, uh, of monuments, uh, uh, abandoned monuments. But uh, when we were there, we, are, we had the feeling that there was one part of the city, and this is, was this pyramid. This, this pyramid was realized uh, in 1993 um, and then abandoned because after the crash of the East European com communist uh, countries, uh, all the financial energies were coming from the U East Europe were stopped and they didn't have the possibility to go ahead to finish, to conclude the construction of the building. It was, has to be an hotel. And the building is there, it's a ruin. It's a, the most visible ruin because it's built on a hill in the center of the city. And they all try to convince you this, this part doesn't exist, which is a sort of, a, um, of a, let me say, a bad uh, and uh, unpredictable effect. Of, uh, but, but the point is that it's there. It's so central, so crucial. So we uh, decided to use the presence of this building like a sort of symbolic antenna. And we have launched a, a competition on the pages of Domus, asking designer, artist, thinker to imagine how this building could be changed. And well, I th think that uh, was great because uh, we received a lot of proposals from the North Korean houses, from North Korean and South Korean for sure students. And uh, for a certain period, we were also in touch with them. So it was a very important because you know how it's difficult to have a to have a bridge, to have a communication with uh, the country which is completely closed. And uh, I had doing this, I really had the feeling of how geopolitics can be a part of the sphere of activities that a magazine can can play. Uh, another thing that we have just finished to do it's a. Uh, research and an action on the subject of sustainability. And uh, from this point of view, we have uh, realized uh, an installation at the last Venice Biennale on the idea of uh, 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 dystopias. So the point is uh, that we know well that uh, sustainability is probably one of the most, uh, one of the last rhetoric of uh, our era. And we know how it's s crucial in, the, in our work. But uh, if we want to be serious, we have to understand well all the possible consequences of this rhetoric. So with this installation, we were simply saying that there are three main uh, ways to work in sustainability. One is a sort of uh, high sort of uh, technocratic option. So let's implement, let's uh, uh, accept more and more technical devices on the surface of our buildings because they can be capable to absorb new energy, solar energy, wind energy, and so on. But from another point of view, this, uh, this idea of uh, high-tech sustainability it's, uh, it's a nightmare because sometimes uh, the diffusion of these devices is uh, extremely relevant. 
And uh, the presence of the device is also determining the quality of our buildings. And uh, some, from another point of view, the, the extension, the pervasivity of the device can also produce some serious risk in terms of uh, uh, the possible extension of a social and political control of our uh, 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 personal behavior. Uh, another point was uh, connected with the, sorry, there is something that doesn't work here. I show you only this image, but uh, uh, another point was connected with the idea that the second possible way to, dec to, to decriminate this rhetoric is uh, a sort of uh, idea of uh, uh, extension of the vegetable surface in our cities. And I think that in the, if in the first case, this first decrimination, this techno technocratic decrimination of the rhetoric of sustainability is linked to what, uh, for instance, things like, uh, thinkers like uh, Jeremy Rifkin is nowadays saying about the necessity to extend everywhere the presence of sustainability devices. This second way to, to, to this idea of uh, 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 straighten and diffuse the presence of agriculture in our uh, environments, in our architecture, on the vertical surfaces, on the horizontal surfaces, which is very popular and very successful nowadays. Well, this is something which probably is connected with a, a tradition of thoughts which comes from the radical movement of the 60s, and uh, which also has some risk. Because from some point of view, it's uh, something of uh, very new and uh, uh, useful. And, but from another point of view, it's uh, it's a certain way to reduce the complexity of the presence of the nature in our urban environment. And uh, just to finish, there is a possible third dystopia, which is connected to the idea that sustainability means also let's accept the presence of animals, let's accept the presence of uh, uh, real uh, nature in our urban environment or and in our buildings. And uh, you know how many paradoxical situations are, uh, are, are nowadays uh, published on the, on, the, on, the, on the magazines, on the newspapers, which are uh, in a way trying witnessing this, this difficult cohabitation between uh, real nature and our human behaviors. So uh, with Habitar, we are now going ahead, trying to, to go deeper in this uh, schizophrenic uh, uh, contradiction between, let me say, how we think sustainability should be and how we are reinterpreting the relation between nature and urban and urban condition through the notion of sustainability. Uh, there are other things, but we are, but uh, I think I'm, not time. this is uh, something we have done in, in, uh, in uh, Torino, on the design, uh, connecting, putting together local communities, designers, and uh, uh, and uh, um, companies. So we are producing like 40 new tools, 40 new objects, thanks to the collective work of local communities, designers, and companies. And that's something that probably needs uh, more, which I don't find today. Uh, simply to finish, I'd love to show you some, uh, some images of uh, the other part of my activity. So I've been involved in the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years in uh, uh, works which are frequently linked with the with the presence of the sea. And uh, um, it's something which is, uh, from a certain point of view, uh, strange, and from another point of view, is, is a result of, a, of a one of my obsession. And so uh, 
I started in Greece uh, some years ago designing a, a dike. Then uh, I've done a competition in Genova in 1992 with the idea to probably we were with OMA um, to realize a, a public space which is under the liberal of the sea. Then uh, we designed the football stadium, another question of mine, always in Genoa. And in this case, the stadium, the stadium was, was an island. It was uh, like uh, you see it there. It was, it was a, uh, and uh, only in the last years, uh, I was uh, asked to uh, work on two buildings which are uh, now in the in a starting phase of construction. Uh, the first is in Marseille and the second uh, is uh, in uh, um, Sardinia. Uh, the first is a, is a let me say is a is a building which hosts the sea. So that, that's something for me very important because uh, uh, with multiplicity, with domus, with habitat, I've worked a lot on the trying to detect the new, the new nature, the new uh, uh, idea of the Mediterranean environment. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, in Kassel, during the art exhibition in Kassel, we produced a, an installation called Solid Sea, in which we were uh, demonstrating how the Mediterranean environment is nowadays like a solid continent, which is uh, crossed by highways. And having highways is used by very specific kind of people, fishermen, militaries, clandestines. And all these corridors are, maybe sometimes they, they cross them, but they are never interact the one with the other. So it's a, like a solid configuration. And the, 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 the cities that pay the cost in, that are, uh, let me say, determining the extension of all these pipes are extremely fixed, and they work like funnels. <laughs> so working as an architect, uh, uh, I, I think that the w I understood that it's so important nowadays when you have to work on the board, the border of, the, of the, our, in, in, on, on, in the portal condition or on the edges of the city uh, to try to realize architectures and buildings which can play a different role. So architectural physics, we can mix the flows of people who can, in a way, put together different kind of things and activities. And uh, uh, this building, which is a, a building dedicated to the Mediterranean, called the House of Mediterranean, who is in Marseille, in the old uh, portal year of Marseille, who is now going to be completely improved and innovated, has exactly this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, idea. So it's a, um, it's a, first of all, it's a building which uh, hosts the sea, not as an ornamental space, but as a part of the architecture itself. Uh, like it happens in many traditional Mediterranean buildings. And uh, this square, this sort of liquid square, it's a, a real public space, so a space where it can happen many things. Uh, the building itself is very simple, but it has its 40 meters uh, jump in terms of structure, which is in a sense realizing the presence of the water. And uh, the other point is the program, which is, as I told you, extremely complex and rich with the idea that you can have different kind of activity on the building. And uh, well, this is uh, going to start to be built uh, at the beginning of next year, and it will be finished for 2011. On another part of the Mediterranean, on Sardinia, I'm now following something which is in construction, so it will be finished in one month. So I cannot show you images of this because it's connected with a uh, a very geopolitical subject, which is the next G8 summit uh, in uh, Sardinia. But uh, the point here was uh, uh, something which is, uh, <laughs> in a way, uh, relevant. So uh, uh, 
was a, an attempt to transform a, a, a now something which is quite an useless event, as we know, as the last financial crisis has completely felicitated. So a, a summit of eight of the most powerful, let me say, um, countries in something of useful. And uh, something what we did uh, also together with the governor of Sardinia, Mr. Soru, who was the founder of Fiscali, and he's now one, in my opinion, one of the most relevant politicians in Europe, is to try to work on the idea of archipelago. So uh, the G8 will be held in an island in an archipelago, which is in the north of Sardinia, between Sardinia and Kos. And the idea was to, this is a metaphor of an archipelago. It's in itself extremely important. So we are trying to, to, to convince before Berlusconi, when, when Berlusconi arrived, the thing was changed, to convince that uh, this, uh, this G8 summit should be, uh, in a way, a, a sort of sprawl <coughs> geopolitical model. So to imagine that all the islands could play a position, could play a role, and so on. Uh, we simply are working on the idea, and I'm showing you this only what I can show you, which are images from the press conference I did, but uh, uh, in a way, uh, this G8 uh, summit was uh, now something which are uh, helping us to imagine uh, also in this case a building which is uh, uh, in direct connection with the water and with the sea, and in direct connection with the view of the, all the islands of the archipelago. And uh, the other thing that we are work doing in this case is that uh, we are seriously uh, uh, thinking to what will happen just before, just sorry, just after the event itself. So how the building, but not only the building, the entire settlement will work uh, uh, with a different nature, like a maritime uh, uh, settlement, uh, a public uh, maritime uh, environment. Uh, but simply to tell you that uh, I, I think that uh, this subject, so the relation, the complex relation between uh, uh, the sea and uh, our physical architecture, or the complex relation of uh, all these kind of buildings, uh, is something which is uh, starts to starts to attract me in terms of uh, the possibility to define architecture has devices. So not simply has, uh, um, let me say, uh, constructions or aesthetical tools, but also like uh, devices which are uh, working, uh, reacting to flows which are coming from the sea and flows which are coming from the land. And uh, in all these cases, I think that what is interesting for me is to understand how these different buildings are capable to react to both these energies which are coming from these two parts of the world. And uh, that's all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Stefano, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm struck with the, with the, uh, by the images of the, of the projects that you show and the way you describe them especially, the buildings at the end. What's, what they seem to return to over and over again is, it, is a deep interest within the studio in a kind of mixing activity, a programmatic mixing that we know is, a, is a, in fact has an interesting deep history within modern architecture, taking activities predefined putting them together in a space or in a form, and then allowing unexpected events, experiences to occur out of that. And it's certainly something that comes through quite dramatically with the stadium <laughs> uh, cr cross inhabitation, yeah. the chaos that night. Um, and that makes me want to ask a question now back towards the magazine, which is, is the way in which the editorial project or projects that you've been working on is deliberately trying to either construct or bring together different audiences or readerships in a single volume issue or, or run of things. I'm, and I'm, I'm curious especially about 
uh, who your reader or audience is, for example, at Avatari right now? Is it defined by, for example, the client one way? And do you imagine rethinking that audience in its current form or bringing new audiences to it? Or, um, or um, maybe in another sense, are there different kinds of magazines out there other than architectural magazines that might be giving you models or ways of working that you're also trying to bring into architecture and the architectural magazine uh, as we know it? Well, that's a good question and I like your application because in a way it's um, the best way to understand uh, the, 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 the ID, the personality of uh, your, of a project like a magazine, but it's not only a magazine, it's a, it's to text its capacity to react to unpredictable news and unpredictable behavior. So uh, I agree. I think that um, also when I when I think to, to Abitare or I think to Gamal, what was uh, exciting was to see how new readers or really <laughs> invisible readers are at a certain point entering in the in the in the in, in your field and are producing reactions. So it's so complicated to, to have a direct uh, uh, contact with the reader. So, you know, so that happens sometimes in situation like this one or happen with, um, with the website better. Websites are uh, extremely important when you have to run a magazine because it's a very one of the windows that you have a direct window. Yeah, absolutely. The feedback is, is very important. But well, we had the feeling that there was like a new well, let me say, a, a new kind of, uh, of publish which is partially substituting the old one. And this is also something which sometimes is problematic because uh, you have also to maintain a certain number of readers, otherwise you become weak and uh, the ads are growing with powerful and so it's a certain setting. Uh, well, I, uh, to be very honest, I, I, can, I cannot answer saying, well, I basically know uh, who are the readers of uh, this magazine nowadays? I have some ideas. I have some geographical ideas, for instance, because I know, for instance, that Abitare is, 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 is very, is quite popular in, in the States, uh, less than Damos in, in, in uh, for instance, here in England or, or, or in French. Um, in Italy, it's, well, probably we have. Uh, completely uh, expelled, uh, we have, we have uh, transfigured and completely changed the kind of public we had, no? so it's completely a new kind of thing. But well, uh, to be very honest, I'm not a very, I cannot give you an answer, a complete answer on this. Can I open up for questions on the floor? Um, I want to ask something in relation to the magazine. What I really enjoy in the work is how you start to attack the status of the object, architecture as an object, but architecture as something that is embedded in daily life. It's embedded in a cultural setting. It really is something that um, cannot be described as an object any longer. And I really like that in, in the magazine work. And I think that also is present in your architectural work. I was wondering also how the, the, the magazine as such becomes something that does not only showcase, which a lot of magazines do, but is something that one can interact with. And I see that as a similarity with, between how you see a piece of architecture and how you see the magazine as something that is essentially something that can be, as you said, modified, changed, um, interrupted, and, and dealt with. And I think that that's, that's a, a fantastic um, attitude to take also very different to a lot of other magazines. And um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on your dislike of the object, if I detect that correctly. <laughs> or or what, <laughs> sorry, or what? The, your dislike of architecture as, as an object. Well, but it's, uh, you know, I want to be very, very uh, also honest. I, my, my idea of architecture is, has nothing to do with the idea that we can uh, nowadays um, um, be uh, work in absence of uh, the real architecture. I don't think so. For instance, I'm 
totally disagree with uh, the last tennis game matter, this idea of the possibility to talk on architecture behind the real buildings. I consider uh, physical, material, mineral, heavy architecture uh, uh, something which is uh, crucial. And uh, uh, also because uh, I think that also what we are used to think as a, a sort of uh, immaterial uh, uh, dimension of architecture is totally related with its physical existence. Uh, to, to, do, to tell this in another words, I think that what we have to explore when we are want to talk about the uh, virtual mediatic aspect of architecture is its symbolic capacity. And its symbolic uh, uh, power is, is totally rooted in its material and mineral presence. So I am just, that's the reason I'm working as an architect, because I completely trust in the capacity of a piece of stone or to produce a, a, a un unbelievably rich sequence of symbolical effects. And uh, I think that that's the reason that when we work uh, as journalists, we have to observe uh, with attention how a physical building that you will never ex experience, you will never explore, that's what I was saying before, is in any case something we can produce an amazing uh, and complicated and unpredictable world uh, of uh, ideas or thoughts, uh, of uh, emotions and so on. No? That's the reason we are working with literature and so on. But that doesn't mean that we are not interested in the physical dimension of architecture, not at all. We are so interested in that dimension that we are interested to explore the capacity that ex that dimension has to produce a rich symbolic sphere of ideas. Uh, well, and that, in a way, is a, is a totally an attempt because it's very sometimes it's uh, something which are I'm not uh, satisfied with what we are doing. Sometimes something is working, but many of our attempts are totally useless because uh, it's so complicated. No, but but uh, I think it. Uh, Worth it, uh, something that is. Hmm. I'm just curious. I'd like to know uh, what kind of magazines would you suggest us to read and what kind of <laughs> magazines you read, except for Abitara? Uh, this is very. Well, I, I am uh, very. Um, you say polemic, so I read uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, let me say, generalistic magazines. So I read a lot of political magazines, for instance, and uh, I am also attracted by art magazines, but I think, to be honest, I think that there is something happening in the art field mm. which is uh, dis disgusting to me in the last year. So it's uh, something which is also, uh, I have worked a lot uh, in, in, in trying to, to, <coughs> to reduce the distance between architecture and, and visual art. And as you know, we did something together. And, uh, but there is something in the last uh, two or three years mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, really, well, astonishing to me. So th there is a, a certain dimension of uh, amorality and uh, completely uh, absence of uh, sense of responsibility in, in the art field. So that's simply to tell you that this is part of my interest, which is now diminishing in a way. And uh, I'm reading uh, architectural media, not too many, to be very honest. Uh, well, I think there are some new, new, new magazines that are coming up in the architectural sphere. One is in China. I think Urban China is one of the best magazines I've ever read. I follow the experience of, let me say, the Dutch tradition, so Archist. Volume has a combination of the Dutch tradition with uh, Mark Wigley, let me say, radical chic complexity. And, uh, and uh, volume is still uh, something that I like. Also, if I think that uh, there is a, and this sort of obsession of avant-gardism, which is very dangerous, because if you don't maintain a connection, a contact uh, 
uh, with your readers, uh, you are lost. So when you do a magazine, you cannot avoid that in any case you have to, you can introduce the most complex, new, provocative things, but always maintaining a, a, a very strong connection with your readers. Because if the idea of new is simply um, in itself, uh, uh, let me say something which is uh, gratifying yourself and uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't deal with the necessity of maintaining a, a very explicit uh, relation with your readers, uh, the new is uh, simply something which is cutting your relation with the public. No? So it's very complicated so how you can introduce new ideas, new way to present architecture, for instance, without uh, uh, losing the relation with the public that uh, followed you. And sometimes I think that this kind of magazine are in a way on the edge of this possible risk. Mm -hmm. That's not an answer. For our for our pleasure, uh, a little sense of your, uh, you know, your working uh, strategies and philosophy, both in magazines, associated events, and your architectural practice. Do you think it's fair to say that one very major priority for you? This is my definition, my personal definition of what I think you're doing, and for me, this is actually something of great value which is what you're doing is you're resurrecting the more um, situational identity of architecture as part of culture. So the situational identity, not just of architecture as object, to refer to the uh, earlier question, but architectural culture. So it's not so much architecture as a, as a visual phenomenon, but it's the use exchange value of architecture in a relational sense, which is why it's so closely related to what happens. And that's very clearly reflected in your strategy towards photography. Because I remember very well when, when um, uh, we featured my, uh, my article on David Adjaye's idea stores in Domus, and the photography was so refreshing by comparison with the much more straight-laced British architectural press where they do it in a very pristine way, like kind of tunnel vision, you know, forget, forget the people almost, just focus on the building as, a, as an imminent object. And by contrast, they actually showed the street market, they showed real people in the photographs, they actually showed the impact of David's building on, on the local community and the, the real life within, within that environment. And, and somehow, the, your, all your photography, it tells a story, but being critical at the same time, isn't there a, a risk that you're still nonetheless presenting a kind of manicured, aestheticized reality? That picture of the building in Medellin, um, which has come from being a very drug-ridden community in Colombia, to something that is resurrecting, you know, regenerating itself. Such a beautiful building, such beautiful children, a favela in the background. Isn't there still the risk that you are positioning reality at the same time that you're um, creating reality? Sure. No, I think that the risk of uh, aesthetizing um, uh, a social condition or a good curating through, uh, let me say, well-done images, uh, environments which are in a dramatic state, I think uh, it's, it's always present. Um, and um, that's the point. We, we, we it's uh, something that you have to consider at the time. So uh, there is not a general answer to what you're saying. It's uh, simply something that you have to, to try to control issue by issue, architecture by architecture, event by event, and so on, space by space. Um, uh, there is another risk, because uh, I know that uh, I'm, I, uh, it's evident. I am attracted by, let me say, impurity. I totally hate uh, what is uh, pure in the representation of architecture. No? And uh, uh, 
that's that's uh, clear. In, uh, I'm honest in this, and uh, I know well that the impurity is uh, is a, is a, is can become. A, Sorry, it can become, a, let me say, a, a sort of a, a kind of aesthetization. And when it becomes an aesthetization, it can, uh, it can uh, cover, exclude from your observation part of the world. So it's a way to, it's a sort of camouflage sometimes, an aesthetization of impurity. Well, but I, I have. That's that's my interest. So I'm I'm interested in it and uh, working. On, I've always working on this. So um, with multiplicity, what I've done basically is this, because sometimes in impurity you find uh, the most uh, strong and and uh, and the new energies. You find uh, the conflicts. You find uh, the real identities of people. You find uh, no. There is a. a a sort of dimension of honesty and impurity, which is more very, very important for a journalist, for a media observer. As an architect, the thing is different. I think w you have to, 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 to fight and uh, to, in a way, to, to absorb impurity in buildings. So it's, I, don't, I don't trust in the architect to say, well, my architecture is uh, the representation of chaos, of conflicts, of impurity. Or, no, I don't think so. I'm totally. Um, in a way, my, 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 my idea of architecture is another one. So I think that architecture has to work with uh, the idea of order, of equilibrium, in any case. But knowing that around you, you have all this. So. I used to be an architect, but for the last 10 years, I've based on the geography department and, um, and so one of the things that made me get a very shift from architecture into geography was the question of usefulness or uselessness of iconic architecture. So I was very much taken by your statement when you said that uh, you should look at the presence of an iconic architecture as a sort of a lateral gaze and yet when you mentioned uh, you know the u possibility of looking at the geopolitics of the G8 and uh, you asked the question of how to make a useless event useful, you turn to iconic architecture as a solution. And uh, so, uh, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit more about why do you look for ar architecture as a solution? And uh, is it iconic or is it ordinary? And may a, u a useless event, can it be made useful in other ways other than looking for architectural solutions? Yeah, no, I think that um uh, the point is very, very complex and important. Uh, and um, the point is that uh, we cannot simply be against iconic architecture. Or we, I think, is not very something of hypocrisy in this. Uh, uh, in the attempt to avoid uh, iconicity in architecture, uh, uh, because iconicity is, uh, it's. Uh, it's one of the possible dimension of uh, of architecture, and um, I think that uh, the point is how much we can uh, invest on it. Uh, there is something in the financial crisis uh, around us which is probably suggesting a, a new way to to consider iconicity. Uh, there is something which is. Uh, reducing the, uh, let me say, the integralism of uh, iconicity in the architectural debate. And probably also in the capacity of iconic, iconic architecture to uh, be the unique player in our uh, profession. So, for instance, in the G8 case, what we, have, which we are trying to do is, is not to to, let me see, to delegate to one iconic architecture possible useful effect. We are working on, on a totally another direction. We are trying to imagine a, a public space, to imagine a maritime environment. Who can be used for three days for a summit? But what we are doing there is not to realize uh, sp the spaces for a summit, are realizing a maritime environment which is 
temporary view for, for a geopolitical event. So uh, in that case, the idea of iconicity is very important because we have imagined a building which has certain uh, features, I know very well, which works with, for the G8, but in my opinion, will work better and in a more serious and in a more precise way for what will happen after the G8. So uh, if you want, it's, uh, it's uh, well, it's a challenge if uh, some people tell me. But the point is very important, so I think it uh, requires not to miss the schematic answer in this one. Concerning the literary side of the magazines, it seems to me that you had more uh, space uh, at Domus rather than Abitare. You had, for example, a couple of pages dedicated to the travels of Ettore Sossas, they were quite interesting, and uh, uh, serializations of the work of Manuel de Landa that now I don't see anymore in Abitare. Is it because Domus gave, it, gave you more uh, means, uh, financial means at your disposal? Uh, yes, part of this is for this. <laughs> And also part is that uh, it's, also, it's also exciting to change. So Abitare is a really different magazine with a different trajectory, a different history. Uh, I really didn't want to simply move Domus in the new scheme. So Abitare is more linked with uh, private, domestic uh, environments. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea to introduce literature was, was in my idea, way, in certain way was more and more uh, more sympathetic with what with the Abitare history than the Domus one. Domus, uh, in Domus I was more, um, I, I had the idea it was uh, easier to touch, uh, for instance, the geopolitical dimension with Domus than with Abitare. Abitare is a different kind of tool and uh, it's more, the, the idea of internal is so rich, complex, interesting. So the idea to work on the notion like cohabitation, for instance, um, it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, if you want a different way to introduce political uh, uh, subjects in, 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 uh, in architectural magazine. But what we have moved, we've done is basically to observe a reality starting from the internal environments instead of observing the external, public, exposed environment to, to, to introduce a critical architectural um, critical uh, points, no? But uh, the idea of internal is so important for us, I mean, because it's part of our lives, so. And if, but in any case, it is, a, it is true, partially true, because Domus is richer, but it is uh, owned by a, a very small publisher. Abitare was uh, less Dori. rich, but is now part of the Rizzoli, ah, Rizzoli group. Rizzoli is one of the most important uh, European publishers. Uh, so it's now in Flammarion, it owns uh, Il Mundo in Sp Spain. So it's uh, quite a sort of international publisher. Do you have a, a time limit uh, of your directorship, like at Domus or? Uh, no, not, uh, no, well, it's three years. The contract is three years, so I started uh, one year and a half ago, and let's see, yeah. It's, a, no, it's not like Domus. Domus, you know, when you arrive, you know that after three, maximum four, uh, in the last periods, because before, Mendini was eight, uh, Gioponti was 50 years, no? So they are now reducing, probably they are <laughs> <some more. laughs> yeah. capacity. There's a question here. I was just wondering, um, the language you use in, I don't know, Domus or Abitari, try to, um, the target is only architects or anybody, like uh, any customer, a lawyer, or you try to focus only mm. for architects? I have been accused to, to use a language who was uh, not for architects, many times. So, uh, in a way, that's, that's true. So I but for instance, I, I don't know, I've shown you, but uh, maybe it's here. The craziest thing we have done was, was with the last Domus issue that uh, 
together with uh, Mario Piazza, who is uh, the Domus Art Director, and who is now with me also in Abitare, so he's someone who is very important for my media experience. Okay, yeah. Uh, we decided to, to, to work on the idea of Esperanto. And uh, <laughs> but, um, I have not here many pages of this, but I think that. Okay. Mm. Um, this issue was, was April 2006, and uh, basically it was without. Uh, after just after the summary, it was uh, and this is like a, a simply key entry or a series of codes which help the readers to uh, to have a, a possible codification of uh, the images. But finally, the, the, all the all the pages were without words, so it's like a, a really global uh, uh, magazine and. Uh, that's, a, that's a, an article on public spaces and the nature of public spaces, I think. Okay, but uh, not to show you. Okay, is there another question? I, I try to find the link. No, no. No, I'm not here. Sorry. Okay, but uh, if you want, I can show you the. Difficult, complicated. Uh, can show you before. Stop there. Stefano, thank you very much. Thank for you coming so much. In. Really appreciate it. Everyone, Stefano's in the building every month with the new issue of Avatare. <laughs>